Well, thank you, Laura, for reading the scripture. And uh, good morning, church family. It's uh, good to be back with you after being away for uh, three weeks with my wife on vacation. Uh, we did a little cross-country trip that uh, took us to see a number of friends, uh, along with going up through North and South Dakota and back. And uh, it's good to be back here with you all. I want to say a uh, word of thanks to uh, Pastor John. Uh, along with Elizabeth King and Molly Johnson for uh, bringing some wonderful messages while we were away. And uh, for all of those that played different roles during that time, thank you so very much. You know, we have a wonderful, beautiful country that we live in, and it's good to just get away uh, from time to time to remember that and to enjoy some of the simpler things in life that we have. I do also want to just mention that uh, today is our daughter Kelsey's heaven date. Uh, 13 years ago today, since the car accident, uh, she loves singing and uh, worshiping God. She sang in the youth praise team and uh, serving and doing mission work. Uh, and she loved playing sports. Uh, those were some of the things she really enjoyed doing. So uh, we remember her today and uh, kind of hold a, a little near and dear place in our hearts on this day uh, in the loss of our daughter, Kelsey, who we know is with God in heaven. And uh, one day we'll, we'll meet again. So would you pray with me? Loving God, we thank you for worship today. It's really good, Lord, to see so many people walking through the doors of our church into that newly renovated welcome space that we have and to be able to come and to sit in this place and to have that hymn sing this morning, even though we had to sing with mask, Lord, it warmed our hearts to sing those songs and to hear our choir and to receive new members and celebrate folks who have served you faithfully. God, this is worship today. And Lord, may our worship today inspire us for the week ahead. May the words of my mouth and the meditation now of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen and amen. Jesus often used one-liners that likely made his hearers think more deeply about life and even their own attitudes about life and indeed their inner motivations. This is one of them. The first will be last, and the last first. What an interesting saying. In our humanness, there's always a danger and benefit we see with this. Recently, uh, on July 26, we recognized our music director, Ernest, with some cookies for everyone to enjoy. If you were here, I'm sure you got one. It wasn't that so many people rushed out to be the first in line to get a cookie. What I did notice is that most got one cookie if they were first in line, except for the last people who received two, three, or four cookies because those were the leftovers. <laughs> of course, our humanness might tell us to be in front because the cookies might run out and we might not get one, right? That's always a possibility to which I trust, try to might justify not doing by saying something like, well, I really didn't need another cookie anyway. You know, I've grown to the place where I'm more like, make sure everyone else gets a cookie first as well. And now as we recognize Deborah Jones today, everyone's going to be waiting around for each other to get not a cookie, but a bag of Hershey Kisses. Don't stress over that. I'm sure there's going to be plenty for all. And may I have a bag of those Hershey Kisses now, please? No, I'm just kidding. The truth is Jesus isn't talking about cookies or kisses here. As we move deeper into Mark's gospel here in chapter 9, and as Jesus continues to engage with his disciples, a discussion arises amongst themselves as to which disciple is the greatest. And it must have escalated a bit to the point that Jesus calls them on it by asking, what were you arguing about on the road? That came on the heels of verses 30 through 32 where Jesus speaks of his looming betrayal and death and rising again on the third day. The disciples being called on it grow silent, almost like they felt ashamed of what they'd been arguing 
about. I wonder, have you ever argued with family or a friend and at the end wondered why in the world the topic you were arguing about was causing so much energy and anxiety or defensiveness to rise up from within and then spewing out? I imagine at some point we've all been there. So which disciple do you think thought he was the greatest? And what might have made them the greatest? Maybe the amount of faith they thought they had? Or how many people they had touched and healed? Or maybe how they handled the finances? Or how long they could stay up with Jesus and pray? How many Old Testament scriptures they memorized and could quote? How many fish or loaves of bread they'd been able to collect? Or how many demons they'd been able to cast out? Whatever caused them to think so highly of themselves, what was it they were missing? They missed Jesus' greater purpose, Jesus' mission in coming to earth as God born as a baby, we call it in the church the incarnation. That Jesus' mission was not to be served, but to serve others. We see that John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, gets this early on when he says, He, being Jesus, must increase while I must decrease. Now, if we were to skip ahead to chapter 10, and we will, we see the same theme of Jesus saying to his disciples, he had come to give his life a ransom for many. This, coming after this first gentle and gracious, crucial conversation, if you will, in chapter 9. Only here in chapter 10, it's evident that James and John were actually the ones seeking both power and position and influence. Jesus, they ask, can we be the ones who sit at your right hand and at your left hand when you come into your glory? They weren't thinking heavenly glory. They were thinking of how Jesus would overthrow the Romans and put Israel and Jerusalem back on the map. They had their eyes set on earthly things. Jesus was thinking of something much deeper, something much more lasting, the kingdom of God. To which he says this, Let the little children come to me, for to such belong the kingdom of heaven. You know, I noticed one of our church members at the gym not so long ago. He's a retired teacher. He wears this shirt that on the back says, to teach is to touch a life forever. Part of the ministry of the church lies in how we too receive children and teach them and show them God's love and God's grace and to share and show them God's word. And notice how important Jesus thinks this is now. He took the children in his arms. Oh my, rabbis didn't have time for such things. Jesus puts his hands on them. And then what does the scripture say he does? He blesses the children. And as a new school year has begun... I just want to say, God bless and be with all of our folks and all of our children involved in any way in your education. For to teach is to touch a life for how long? Forever. And I just say, thanks, Bruce Boyd, wherever you are this morning. Jesus could have required or even influenced people to serve him, to elevate him to follow him even in the battle. But that's not why he came to earth. In this, the key trait that sticks out for me is humility. Jesus was a humble servant who, because he put others' needs and interests before himself, was followed and sought out by many. 
Those in power saw how that attracted people. They noticed how Jesus included those who were often excluded. Women, children, Children, the the sick, sick, sinners, sinners, and and tax collectors, collectors, whom whom everyone everyone despised. And And then then they they questioned Jesus on why he hung out with such people. And And this this statement of the first being last and the last being first, it's it's a little bit similar similar to the one who loses their their life will find it, while whoever whoever wants to save their their life will lose it. Do you see some similarity there? And And that that was shared shared earlier earlier in this section in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 39. So what we see here then in Mark chapter 8, 9, and 10 is a running theme. Jesus saying we should be willing to give ourselves for the sake of the gospel, not because of what we lose, but because of what we have to gain. To as our daughter Kelsey was to preach on this 13 years ago, that we would have passion for Christ and passion for people. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 13, which we know as the love chapter. What if I gain everything in the world, but I have not love? Then I'm a noisy gong or clanging cymbal or maybe like a bell out of tune with God or maybe a bell out of tune with my bell choir teammates. Which bell is most important when you're playing a piece of music? Is there one bell that's more important? It's a rhetorical question, right? Each bell is important for the song to ring true and make sense and be complete. It's a little bit like what the choir sang today in that little song that you saw in the video about how those voices all kind of get tuned in together to one another. If you serve God and others just for what you can get out of it, it means nothing if your motivation is wrong or misplaced. Jesus asked, what good is it if one gains the whole world yet loses their soul? Jesus wants his disciples then and us now to know there is no greater thing in life than serving others. This is selfless, and it's prideless living. And let's face it, it often takes some maturing for us to get there, doesn't it? Can you recall times in life where you thought everything should revolve around you? Where you thought you should be elevated to a role, or maybe elevated to a position, in a sport, in a band, or at work, or in some organization like the Scouts or 4-H or FFA or other club or getting a part in a theater piece, or maybe some civic group? Have you had times when you knew you thought more highly of yourself like James and John did than others? Well, sure, many of us have. Jesus came to show us there's another way. I'd suggest not the only way we can choose to live, but I think the best way we can choose to live. Our small group has been using the resource called the Wesley Challenge, which includes the 21 questions that John Wesley and his group at Oxford used to help themselves grow in faith. John Wesley was the unwitting founder of the Methodist Church. It was never his initial intention to start a new denomination. His initial intent was to help those in his care to grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ. His questions were designed to help with three areas. First, our relationship with God, giving us an upward focus. Just take a moment and look up, if you would, and say upward focus. Second, our relationship with self, to give us an inward focus. Just think in your mind, inward focus. And third, our relationship with others in order to give us an outward focus. Focus. If you could say that with me, just say outward focus. So it's upward, inward, outward. I wonder, this is something that really amazed me when I got to Altersgate, and it took me probably six months to really notice this. And I hope you've noticed it at some point in time, way before I did. But have you ever noticed the little crosses on the back grid 
of our sanctuary and the arrows that point in different directions. We have a little picture there for you that kind of shows you a little bit. Notice the arrows that are there in that grid. How, how many of you have ever seen those before? You knew those arrows were in that grid. Okay, so some of you. But I thought, you know, that took some thought from somebody to design that. To remind us our Christian faith is about upward, inward, and outward. And that's what that looks like on that grid that sits right behind you right there. So take a moment and check that out. One of these 21 questions in the inward section is this. It's very simple. Am I proud? Am I proud? That's just not a question we typically ask ourselves all the time, right? The chapter talks about a picture taken on February 14, 1990 by the Voyager 1 space probe of Earth that was 3.7 million miles away. Our planet fits into one tiny pixel. Carl Sagan used it in a public speech to help his hearers put things into perspective. And that's what that picture looks like. And you can't really, in that picture, it doesn't really do it justice, but down on the right side of the line coming down, it's the more uh, cream color line, there's a little itty bitty dot. And you probably may not even be able to see it on that picture, but if you go into Google and pop it up, you can take a look at that. He shares this in his speech that day, that that's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you have ever heard of, every human being who ever lived, lived out their lives. He concludes this. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home any of us have ever known. That sure gives us perspective. I think the perspective which Jesus and John Wesley share. Chris Abel writes, pride is a symptom that our perspective is too close to earth. He suggests that when our hearts and souls are face down towards our own lives, we'll naturally struggle with pride. And that seems to be the case amongst the disciples, right? At least James and John outwardly, maybe all of them inwardly. What happens with pride when it's out front, seen, or maybe it's even unseen, but we know it's there? When our energy and time and thoughts all revolve around our own life and concerns and our own pleasures, or when we feel superior to others, even better than others. Living like you are the center of the universe. It's the idea of somebody serve me. Did you know that pride is actually a symptom of low self-esteem tied with feelings of insecurity and worthlessness? If you are brave enough to go inward and ask yourself the question, am I proud? you are also asking yourself, am I secure in my own identity? And as a follower of Christ, the preferred outcome of Jesus is that you'll be and I'll be one who serves, a servant of Christ. With that, we begin to better understand Jesus' one-liner, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Now, I know and I'm sorry, Christina, probably nobody is going to want to be the first one to go through line to get Hershey Kisses this morning. So we may have to bring them to you. I don't know. <laughs> but friends, let's live our lives not just for what today might offer us, but what we can do for others. To teach is to touch a life for how long? Forever. Let's live our lives for the end. For the time when the fullness of the kingdom of God is realized. For in the losing of our lives, Jesus promised us, we will find our lives. We will find our life. You will find your life. 
We won't have to walk along or sit around and argue amongst ourselves about our position or what we think we might deserve or what will most benefit me. Why? Because we'll be more concerned about that which Jesus is concerned about. How we can use what God has given us to further the work of God's kingdom through our lives and through our church. And how our lives can help life to be better for all of those around us. Including how we care for and teach and get involved with our youth and our children and the most vulnerable amongst us. Am I proud? I hope you'll ask yourself that question today. Or am I willing to grab hold of a more Christ-like perspective? To serve as Christ has served, to live into the idea that the first shall be last while the last shall be first without living into a place of self-depreciation. After all, friends, we are all children of God and people of worth, valuable and precious to God. And so is everyone else. All living together on this pale blue dot. Let's pray together. Oh God, you are the creator of this wonderful universe. Just to have some time to watch the sun come up on the horizon and the sun set behind the mountain with that last glimmer of light. Oh, how it blesses the soul. You are the one who created each of us. We are thankful and mindful for and of the life you've given to us. We ask that you would guard our hearts and our minds that we might see as you see. Help us find our security in you and free us from the need to feel superior to others. Help us see our place in your kingdom to serve as you have called us to serve and to serve with a humble spirit. To reach out and love others as you've loved us, not not just with talk and making noise about it, but serving with true unconditional love, realizing every person has been gifted to play their role in the life of the church. For all who are in need of your help and need hope, we ask that you would touch them. And Lord, where we need the same, touch us, O God. And Lord, for all who lost their lives in this week's terrorist attack and the families of our military who are grieving the loss of our soldiers and their loved ones, their family members, give them peace, O God, as those who lost their lives we know served with greater purposes. And Lord, for those this day that are in the path of this Hurricane Ida, we pray, O God, that you help people who can to get out that they might do so, and God watch over so many, the more vulnerable that may not be able to do so. And Lord, help us be ready to respond and help in any way we can. And God, on this day, we want to celebrate the life and faith of one who has rung true, who inspires us to serve others as she has served so faithfully for so long. God, we say thank you for your servant, Deborah Jones, who has set us an example for us all to follow. Now, Lord, we give you thanks. We know we need your help, and there are so many others who do as well. 